Hello, everyone. The SMITU webinar, The Role of Supply Chain in Addressing Top safe, Patient Safety Concerns, with Tom, Tom Score from the ECRI Institute, will begin shortly. We thank you for your patience. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this SMITU webinar, The Role of Supply Chain in Addressing Top safe, Patient Safety Concerns. My name is Nancy Anderson, and I'm the Associate Executive Director of SMI, and I want to welcome you to this 60-minute webinar. Before I introduce our presenter for the day, Tom Skorup, there are just a few housekeeping items I wanted to share with you. First, all of the attendees are in listen-only mode. However, you can ask questions at any time via the submit your question feature, and we will have time for questions throughout the program. We will also be using the live poll feature today, and we will be polling you. When we launch the live poll, you will be able to provide your answer right on the screen and see how the answers all stack up between all the participants. Just for your information, today's webinar is being recorded. It will be added to the SMITU library and the slides will also be sent to all participants via email. And, there, and the, there will be a brief survey at the conclusion of the program today. So please take a few moments to provide your feedback. We do use this information to make improvements for future webinars and other programming from SMI. So without further ado, I wanna begin our program. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Tom Skorup, Tom is the Vice President of Applied Solutions for the ECRI Institute. He has responsibility for the ECRI Institute's on-site consultative service, applied solutions group, and management of major projects within healthcare organizations. For more than 30 years, Tom has worked with healthcare providers to forecast, plan, procure, and manage the unique challenges that the healthcare technology poses to healthcare service delivery. Tom, I want to thank you so much for supporting SMI and presenting this webinar today. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to you. And you should have the screen now, Tom. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, uh, Tom. Well, well, thank you, Nancy. And, and thank you uh, to, for this opportunity to present this uh, webinar today. Um, this webinar is actually a little bit of a repeat. We presented this webinar, this presentation at the 2019 Fall Forum of SMI. And as we go through the program, you'll see some of the feedback we received from that. We had some great input to the and topic. And Tom, if we're I may, to... yes. the, the reason that we've called you back for the webinar is because this was the highest rated uh, workshop that we had at the Fall Forum. So thank you for presenting again. Well, that's uh, that's even better to hear. <laughs> but yes. uh, th thank you, Nancy, and uh, yeah, and hopefully uh, it will you'll get to hear some of the feedback from the fall forum here of thoughts on this topic, uh, and then we look forward to hearing the participants' thoughts later in the presentation as well. And this topic, I think, is really timely for for SMI as we talk about more of a clinically integrated supply chain. Uh, really, what we'll focus on today is the first half of the presentation. We'll talk about a number of top patient safety concerns that are facing healthcare today. And then we'll shift in the back half of the presentation to talk about how can supply chain be a player and team member to contribute to addressing some of these top patient safety concerns. So let's jump right in. Uh, the top concerns that I'll be talking about today come from two um, reports that Equity puts out each year. These are public service reports that we put out that highlight what we're seeing in two areas of, of patient safety. The first is our health technology hazard list. We put out a top 10 list each year. Uh, and what we focus, this, where these topics are coming from, is they're coming from the what we're learning in testing medical devices in our testing labs, the accident investigations we're doing for when things go wrong, our voluntary re problem reporting system, which in a way is kind of an early 
warning system for things that might become FDA recalls or hazards from our patient safety organization and also from our consulting work. And each year, uh, all the different departments of equity put together and nominate topics that end up them being vetted out to create our top 10 list each year. The second list is our top 10 patient safety concerns list. And this, these are topics that are coming from our patient safety organization. ECRI's patient safety organization is one of the largest in the country, and we receive more hundreds of reports weekly about adverse events and near misses that are occurring in healthcare. And so this is a summary of really the top 10 most contemporary issues that we believe hospitals and caregivers should be aware of uh, to try and highlight those and give recommendations on how you can be, begin to address these. These, this information is, is publicly available and can be downloaded for free from our website if you're interested. But what we're going to do now is we're going to walk through um, ten, the top 10 list of the hazards, because I think these are most applicable for our supply chain community. And then also I've selected several, I'm not going to go through all 10, but several of the patient safety concerns that I think also are relevant uh, for supply chain discussion. <clears throat> so without hesitation, we'll jump into the list. The first topic on our health technology hazard list is the misuse of surgical staplers. For years, ECRI has been receiving reports about stapler malfunctions. The good news is the vast majority of the malfunctions that we uh, investigate are not related to device failures. They're more related to how the device is actually being used. Whether this be errors in such as you know, clamping down on tissue, that might be too thick, or for firing the staples over another clip or another instrument. Uh, those are just two examples of some of the common errors that we've seen as part of this. But why are we concerned about this? Well, the reality is a stapler failure can have very severe consequences. A failed staple line can lead to uh, patient fatalities. Um, and one of the most common sources of that is an incomplete staple line can lead to uncontrolled bleeding for a patient, uh, which can lead to intraoperative hemorrhaging, postoperative bleeding, or to simply tissue damage. Why this topic we felt was particularly important this year is that in 2019, the FDA made um, additional reports available that were not publicly available before um, about uh, device recalls and hazards that they've been tracking. And one of the areas, staplers in particular, they released more than 100,000 reports that showed uh, more than 400 deaths since 2011 that were not, this is information that was not publicly available before, which really raised the level of urgency in considering uh, what could be done to alleviate some of these errors occurring with the use of staplers. So much so that the FDA is also considering reclassifying staplers to a higher risk category. Moving to our second topic for the hazard list, and this is related to um, the rapid diffusion of mobile and portable ultrasound. Ultrasound, the wonderful thing about ultrasound is if you think about the old time ultrasound scanners were big boxes that we rolled around the hospital. Today, you can have ultrasound on your smartphone or on a tablet or on a PC. So that's fantastic that it's highly portable. It's relatively inexpensive and, and very easy to use. In fact, so easy to use that we've heard stories about some medical schools thinking about handing out smartphone-based ultrasound scanners with probes to their medical students, along with stethoscopes. But what is the flip side of this trend? This rapid adoption of this technology brings with it the potential for other unforeseen risks. And this is that the fact that this rapid diffusion is outpacing the development of the guidelines and recommendations of when it should be used, how to train the users of it, should they be licensed and credentialed, and also topics such as really what are the competencies to make sure that someone is appropriately using this technology. So let's take the example of a, a doctor who just received a portable ultrasound. They've been trained to use it for one purpose, let's say an emergency department, and a patient comes through and they say, well, 
let me try and use it for something else and maybe not send that patient for a full imaging study. And they missed something that the full imaging study would have found. We're now leading to not only a misdiagnosis, um, we're also leading to the potential for delayed care for that patient. So this is something that we think is very important that you know, the convenience and portability of technology may, in the early stages of diffusion, may be creating challenges that are unforeseen and that more ever oversight is needed as we look at this, uh, this exciting new technology and as it diffuses into the marketplace. Our third topic in our technology hazard list is infection risks from sterile processing. Now this into itself is not a new topic. This is something that we've all been talking about quite a bit, I'd say over the last five years. But more specifically is errors that can occur in medical and dental offices. If you think about who processes your instruments in a hospital, it's typically going through a dedicated central sterile supply staffing process. But when you go out to your doctor's offices or your or dental offices, you're talking about staff that are probably multitasking. This is staff that may be asked, they may be med techs, they may be nurses, they may be other allied professionals that are being asked to clean, disinfect, and sterilize instruments, um, really in, in addition to other assignments that they have. Um, and by adding this variability to the process, we introduce the potential or higher potential for an error to occur in that process. To give some specific examples is that uh, that we have seen at ECRI have been examples, for example, of benchtop sterilizers that are being used by staff that have never been trained on how to use these sterilizers. Or, uh, and this is probably a more common case, is they're stopping the sterilization cycle um, to add new items to the sterilizer or removing items before the full cycle has been completed. Not allowing a full sterilization cycle to go through will compromise the ability to fully reach full sterility for these products. And also topics such as not understanding what some of the normal procedures are, such as flushing and proper draining of steam sterilizers. So this is an area where as we extend our services more and more into the community, uh, have higher acuity procedures being performed outside the hospitals, just need to be aware that our support structures may not exist that and we may not be comparable to what we currently have in our hospitals. Our next topic speaks to really the intersection of two trends. Um, this is specifically about hemodialysis, risks with central venous catheters, and a movement to move more home dialysis to a home-based setting. Why is this important? Well, first, many hemodialysis patients receive treatment through a central venous catheter. And these catheters can be placed in large vessels such as your jugular vein, which go directly, have direct access to your heart. Often these central venous catheters also may be left in place longer than typically prescribed before you transition maybe to another vas vascular access port, such as uh, AV fistula. In parallel to this is the U.S. federal government is looking to push more use of dialysis to the home care setting. This will be consistent with what's being done in other countries. Uh, in Europe, for example, quite a bit of uh, dialysis is done in the patient home. But as we start to think about if these patients have central venous catheters placed in, our, in a home setting, it's a game changer. First, in the hospital, when you have these catheters, you, know, you have trained staff, you have nursing staff that can identify if an infection or clotting, or if a disconnect, God forbid, occurs with this catheter, they can be there to treat that patient immediately. Because what could happen is the patient, the patient could bleed out if this catheter becomes dislodged. So, but when you go to the home setting, now let's envision who is there as the caregiver. In many cases, it may be a family member who really is not trained and appropriately prepared to deal with the consequences of a central venous catheter. So as we move forward in this migration of hemodialysis to the home care setting, 
we need to be aware of some of these risks and practices that need to be thought through so that the risks don't outweigh the benefits for home-based heat dialysis. Our fifth topic is related to surgical robotics. If you think about surgical robotics in your hospitals today, you know, we have our bread and butter procedures, um, procedures of the prostatectomy, procedures for hysterectomies, um, and increasingly, we're using our robots to do general surgical procedures, such as hernia repair, uh, the removal of gallbladders, and more. <clears throat> but in parallel, we also have a completely new generation of robots on the horizon. Robots that are uh, manipulating catheters for endovascular procedures, robots that are doing bronchoscopy procedures and pulling lesions out that we couldn't do as minimally invasive before. And but the one key thing to understand is as these new surgical robots and as importantly, these new procedures emerge, often the effectiveness of these early procedures is not yet fully known. Also, the risks associated are, have not been fully assessed because there really hasn't been a, pop, a, a volume of procedures enough to really vet out and fully understand all the risks that could occur. So what does that do? That shifts some of this burden to the provider to make sure that as you're looking to bring in these new surgical procedures, that you have a full awareness of the potential for injury to your patients, uh, unexpected complications, and importantly, long-term outcomes being affected. Because often many of the complications that occur from these robotic procedures do not present immediately. They present over an extended period of time. So it's really important for hospitals to understand that in bringing in new surgical robotic procedures that your surgeons may be advocating for, um, certainly we don't want to discourage you from pursuing those, but I think it's important to go in with both eyes wide open that there's a burden there for the hospitals to really monitor those new procedures from an outcomes pers risk perspective, as well as the effectiveness perspective for the patients. And are they having equal or better outcomes with the robots that you were getting with your uh, other procedures you were using before? So now I'm going to, we're gonna have four poll questions today spread throughout our, our session. Uh, the first question here for poll number one is going to be, for the five health technology hazards that we've discussed so far, which, if any of these, is the top priority at your organization? Nancy, could you activate the poll for us? Should be active now for all participants. We'll give them a couple of seconds to see what kind of responses. So if everyone would go to the polling questions on the um, dashboard for the program, you should be able to see the checkboxes and pick the checkbox that most applies to you. I am not seeing answers, but that may be. Maybe I need to unshare my screen. No, oh wait, did I hit launch? I didn't hit launch. Now yeah, I've yeah. launched it. There we go. Now we've got it. I had to hit one go. more button. Thanks for your thanks for your patience. There we go. So we'll give it about 10 more seconds and then we'll show the results. Okay, and I'm going to close the poll in five more seconds. So if you haven't put your answer in, please do so. And when I close the poll, um, Tom, I'm not sure you'll be able to see it, but I can speak to the results of the poll. And I, when I close the poll, we'll go back to your um, page. Sounds, sounds good. Okay. So we've got um, 
misuse of surgical staplers has come out as number one. Um, no one answered that adoption of point of care ultrasound um, is outpacing safeguards. And then uh, unproven surgical robotic procedures came in second with 27%. Um, home dialysis risks at 13%. And infection risks from um, sterile processing errors came in at 7%. So we've th those are the, the rankings of the results. Fantastic. <clears throat> And Tom, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Let's carry on. We'll move on to uh, alert number number six. <clears throat> well, I'm jumping ahead. I'm giving uh, I'm giving it away. Uh, hazard number six is related to alarm, alert, and notification of alert. Now, many of you may be familiar with. I'm sorry, my microphone's probably tucked away here. M many of you are probably familiar with medical device alarm fatigue. This is a topic that we've been talking about for the last five to 10 years. And in fact, it's been a national patient safety goal by the Joint Commission over the last five years. But when we think about the alarms that we've been trying to manage coming from medical devices, which can be 200 to 300 alarms per day uh, from a single patient, we're now adding a whole nother layer of alerts and notifications. These are coming from more sophisticated nurse call systems, but more so they're coming from electronic health records and the clinical decision support tools that are coming along with the ability to get patient data and mine that patient data to, do, um, to guide caregivers in providing better care that's more aligned to evidence-based medicine. So what is this, what's the result of this? This is leading to cognitive overload for many clinicians. And we've seen cases where you know, they are maybe inappropriately modifying or disabling some of the notification settings or are simply just distracted or sensitized by just the vast amount of alarms, alerts, and other notifications that they're being barraged with each day. So <clears throat> it's important to understand as we're bringing new technology on board that it is additive and it's adding to things we already have today, and that there's a need to understand the full load that's coming in for caregivers as we're looking at the adoption of new technology or new procedures um, to take action appropriately. Topic number seven is related to cybersecurity. Cybersecurity risks more specifically in the connected home healthcare environment. The same cybersecurity risks exist that exist in hospitals also exist in the community, and more specifically in patients' homes. If we think about uh, patient monitoring being used in the home, there are a number of threats that need to be understood. First is there's new ways that that data could be disrupted uh, from getting from the patient to the caregiver uh, versus in a hospital where it's a little more defined. Also, the ability or the potential for the device's performance to degrade, and since it's remote, not understand that, not understanding that it is degrading. And of course, PHI, um, the opportunity for more variables to affect the potential release of very sensitive uh, protected health information for a patient. And some of those challenges are related to, when we think about it, that, a, a, for example, a patient's home network. Uh, you may have a patient who their device is connecting to their Wi-Fi network. And let's say their network doesn't have a password, which means it's completely open and that their, their data, uh, in some cases the PHI, may be very easily discoverable. Also, physical access to the devices in a home care setting. If you think about how often you're accepting on your PC a software update, which may have a patch that is fixing a vulnerability in your uh, virus protection software or blocking spam or phishing from, from affecting your computer. Well, picture this now happening uh, for a device that is in a patient home that you don't have direct access to, to make sure that the updates are taking and that that device is appropriately protected. <clears throat> and obviously patient compliance is the role of a you know, a variety of users that may have different experiences when using these types of devices, it can be difficult to sustain 
an effective monitoring system with the variability of these different users. So it's important to understand that the cybersecurity risks in the home environment are the same as the hospital, but also there are some additional elements that need to be thought about. The device's monitoring capabilities, a lack of those could prevent the ability to acquire the data, transfer the data to a caregiver, and even let the caregiver know that the data is not getting to them. Because the overall purpose of home health care is to monitor a patient, keep them at home, and understand if their care, um, if their condition begins to deteriorate, that you can intervene sooner before they are readmission to your hospital. Moving on to our, our eighth health technology hazard. If you think about the number of implants that patients receive today, that number has grown dramatically in the last 10 and 20 years. Now picture these patients when they're going for an MRI scan where their implant may be contraindicated to an MRI. So let's think about those implants. Um, 20 years ago, we were probably talking primarily about pacemakers and maybe implantable cardio defibrillators. Today, we're talking about watchman devices. We're talking about stents. We're talking about neurostimulators. The list of implants has grown dramatically and continues to grow every day. So when these patients present themselves for an MRI scan, we need to understand what implanted devices they may have. And the challenge is that information is not always readily available from one repository. Typically, we need to go through various information systems and in many cases, going through patient paper, patient records to see if these patients have any implants. Also, screening processes can be uh, less than perfect as patients can forget that they have an implant or uh, they may be older and not um, unable to speak uh, on their own behalf as part of that. But it's been proven that screening can be an unreliable process for identifying implants. So why are we concerned about this? Well, the obvious is, is harm to the patient. You know, the patient having something that's contraindicated and malfunctions or moves or worse yet um, is explanted through an MRI scan. But also the fact that not having access to this information can delay the patient's scan and delay the care for that patient, which can also lead to harm. And lastly, not least, is also the fact that clinicians may be pulled away from active patient care while they're searching for this implant information and can greatly disrupt their, uh, their productivity. Number nine on our list is medication errors related to dose timing discrepancies in an electronic health record. One of the key elements of medication is making sure that patients get their medication the right dose and as importantly, at the right time. So a prescriber may intend for a patient to get um, a new medication immediately. However, when they put it into the order entry system, they, the electronic system that triggers the nurse to deliver that medication may not be appropriately reflecting what the prescriber had intended. Let me walk through an example that I think will exemplify this. A, a physician does his rounds, um, in the late morning and decides they want this patient to be started on a particular medication and they want them to have that medication as soon as possible. So the physician goes into their order entry system and they put the medication in, but either they're not aware of the default settings in the system or they're not able to pull up and actually see the default settings. And the default setting is that the medications will be started the next day at eight o'clock when the nurses do their med pulls. So in this case, that patient may be delayed starting on a medication by 24 hours or about maybe 20 hours, um, and that can have a consequence for that patient's care. So many systems, as they have identified this challenge, are creating functions for a now or ASAP button or function for physicians to click into to work around that or making the default administration times explicit so that the prescribers know when that first medication will start. And in some cases, allowing them to manually set that. 
but many of our systems are by default preset with these types of settings that our prescribers may not be aware of or may not be able to control. <clears throat> We've seen the consequences of this by delayed medication doses, which can have an effect on the patient's condition uh, and can also lead to an extended length of stay for that patient. So now we'll move to number 10 and the last of our, our top 10 on the health technology hazard list. This is probably our least sophisticated of the 10 hazards, but probably the most prevalent is loose nuts and bolts can lead to catastrophic device failures and injury. If we think about just wear and tear of, of anything mechanical, uh, nuts, bolts, screws, whether it could be your, your chick kitchen um, bar stool or, or anything in your house, the things loosen up over time. But a failure to repair or have these on a medical device can have pretty severe consequences. They can lead to devices tipping, collapsing, falling, or even shifting during use, which can compromise patient care. Let me give you a few examples. And by the way, this is a topic that our research engineers have been kind of pushing for for a while because it's something that we continually see and a number of reports is staggeringly high. But let me give the example of a patient lift where components became disengaged during use and the patient fell. Another example is ceiling mounted devices and equipment that have fall, fallen and fallen on patients or in some cases crushed patients uh, in the example of an imaging gantry. Casters, something fairly simplistic, just loose casters on a mobile x-ray system or a baby scale cart that could cause them to tip over, uh, in this case, having an infant fall on the ground. Or loose screws on an imaging system, which doesn't seem dramatic, but when you think about the devices wobbling during the imaging and degrades the image, that patient may need to be uh, receive additional x-ray dose because they have to be re-imaged due to the poor image quality. Or it may delay care for that patient with not having access to that information. So this is something that sounds fairly simplistic, sounds very obvious, but continues to be a persistent problem that we see uh, with technology. At this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Nancy, and we're gonna ask the same question over the last five topics we just covered. Um, of these topics, which hazards are top priority at your organization? Nancy, could you open the poll, please? I believe the poll is distributing at the moment. There we go. We've got some answers coming in. Wonderful. Give it about 30 seconds for people to read the questions and come back with their answers. Wonderful. And I've, I've discovered how to share the responses after, so I'll be able to do that this time. Um, thanks for your patience as I learn this new system. Okay, about five more seconds and I'm gonna close the poll. And as soon as I close it, then I will share the results with the group. Tom, can you see those results? I do not. You can't. The attendees are viewing the polling results. So we've got 44% for alarms, alert, and notification overload. We've got 22% for cybersecurity risks. 17% um, said loose nuts and bolts. Medication errors were 11%, and missing implant data delays um, were 6%. So it seems like we've still got a, an overwhelming response to one, which is that alarms and alerts, and then the other three, other four answers follow. Fantastic, and, uh, it, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I know that you know alerts have been. Uh, we learned a lot from medical device alarms, but you know a lot of the lessons we learned from that really can be brought across to the alert and notification um, process uh, just as effectively. So that, that's great to hear the folks are working on that. Great, we're going to transition now from the top ten top ten hazard list to patient safety concerns. 
And as you can see with the list of concerns here, um, there's quite a few. I'm not gonna go through all, but there's several that I thought were particularly intriguing from a supply chain perspective. The first is patient safety concerns involving mobile health. The second is developing and maintaining skills. And thirdly, is infections from peripherally inserted IV lines. So let's look at these a little more closely. <clears throat> mobile health. You know, mobile apps, digital medicine, digital health, we're hearing all of these things every day, right? Mobile apps are proliferating across healthcare, and they offer great promise. But at the same time, they also offer new risks that we need to be aware of. For example, many of the mobile apps that are coming out really lack uh, regulation. Um, and what that does is it shifts the burden to the providers to be validating the effectiveness and understanding the risks of the adoption of these new mobile health applications or, or technologies. <clears throat> so for example, a device may <clears throat> accurately, <clears throat> excuse me, may accurately acquire data, but it may not be effectively communicating it to the caregivers that are expecting to trend that data over time. Also, there's the potential because many of these mobile health technologies are used in the community for a patient not to be correctly using that technology either. We're not using it at all. In fact, for many mobile health applications, they do not today fit under the um, auspices of FDA regulation. Uh, and so the FDA is not testing many of these new apps. There are some, uh, for example, the Apple Watch, which did get FDA approval, but there are many health apps out there that are not approved by the FDA or nor do they require approval by the FDA. So again, this shifts the onus onto the healthcare provider to ensure that you've thought through the number one, the effectiveness of these devices. Also, do they do what they profess to do? Uh, have you assessed the ease of use? Because in some cases, it's gonna be ease of use for not just the user, but for your frontline providers, caregivers that are gonna be training the patients on how to use these mobile health applications as well. And also, are you selecting the right patients uh, that these new technologies are targeting? The sec second uh, patient safety con uh, concern I wanted to talk about was developing and maintaining skills. Supply chains on the front line of the adoption or the acquisition of many new technologies. And with these technologies also comes new procedures. Patient harm often occurs when staff are uncomfortable with either the equipment and or the procedures that they need to perform. Infusion pumps have been probably the poster child for medical equipment uh, user errors over the years. And not surprisingly, these, these, these devices have become, excuse me, increasingly more complex as we've gotten to smart pumps that have medication libraries and the dosing. Um, and also think about the, the staffing that you have using these pumps. You may have a nurse who's moving from one unit that has a lower criticality of patients where they use single channel pumps is now moving to a critical care unit that uses a three channel pump that she's never or he's never seen before. Uh, whether it be the being uncomfortable with that training or um, just not being familiar with that type of pump it introduces the potential for patient harm. Similarly, on the procedural side, and for a caregiver that hasn't put a full catheter in <clears throat> in a while, their technique may not be optimal. And the inappropriate insertion of a full catheter could lead to a patient getting a urinary tract infection. So understanding both from a procedural perspective, as well as from an equipment use perspective, areas where staff may be unfamiliar or where they may not have had access to um, a particular department or care area before should proactively be identified on and addressed through uh, training measures. Commonly, we're seeing the use of simulation training um, as in parallel to competency training used to parallel this, 
so that caregivers can more frequently get a chance to practice their skills and keep them up to par. Our last topic on the top patient safety concerns is infections from peripherally inserted IV lines. IV lines in many institutions um, have become almost a standard that when a patient is admitted by procedure, they would automatically put a peripherally uh, uh, inserted IV catheter in just in case the patient downstream would need IV therapy. Now, anytime you break the skin, you're breaking the body's first line of defense against infections. And one of the, the challenges here is that many caregivers believe, because we've been doing it for so long, that these IV lines uh, really bring a quite minimal risk of infection. And so they don't really think about the, uh, these peripherally inserted you know, IV lines uh, when an infection does occur, which has made it very challenging for the tracing of infections that are related to these, these lines. Because caregivers, frankly, just aren't considering them when they're trying to investigate why a patient has developed an infection. So we raise this as an issue because we believe that there is a, a standard of care that emerged in many organizations of just by policy, putting and starting these peripherally inserted IV lines for a patient because they are being emitted. I'm really asking people to think a little more before moving forward with these IV lines to avoid breaking that first barrier uh, to prevent infections. So this brings us to our third poll question. Of these three top patient safety concerns, uh, which of these, if, if any, uh, is a top priority at your organization? Nancy, could you open the poll, please? I've just launched the poll, so everyone should be seeing the questions. And in about 20 more seconds, I'll share the results. A lot of votes coming in. That's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close the poll in about five seconds more. And I'm going to share the results. Um, and Tom, I'm, I assume you still can't see the results. I apologize for that. Um, and I, I don't know if everyone else can see them either, so I'll just um, identify that the patient concerns, safety concerns involving mobile health did not get any votes. Um, the top vote getter was developing and maintaining skills um, as the number one concern and infections from peripherally inserted in IV lines was the second um, and none of the above came in at 6%. So the vast majority said their biggest concern is, uh, biggest priority is developing and maintaining skills. That's great. Got the screen back. Thank you. And I think that's interesting because I think as we think about mobile health, you know, what are the procurement processes for mobile health? Where are they, where are they purchased? How are they coming into your systems? And we're very early on in that process. And I think that's going to be one that's going to be interesting to watch going forward. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, this presentation was presented at the 2019 fall forum. And I have to say it was one of my enjoyable presentations because we had a very robust conversation with a lot of really good points being raised, both from, uh, from an industry perspective as well as from a provider perspective. What I'd like to do is share some of the comments and thoughts from that discussion. So the first was discussion around, and not surprisingly, the user error that was mentioned earlier, hazards and safety risks associated with that. We had a very robust discussion about this topic, about some of the training challenges and some of the opportunities that exist out there. So one point that was raised quite strongly was that an awful lot of work needs to be done by the suppliers to meet FDA requirements for training. And they weren't quite sure if providers fully understood the amount of work that they have done on uh, education for the use of their products. 
and whether this would offer an up or an opportunity for more collaboration between the providers and the suppliers to share that information that they've developed for their FDA requirements uh, and are feeding out there and have available. So making sure that all the knowledge they have about the usability of their products and effective use of those are getting into the hand of the frontline users. Another discussion point was one of the provider members was given an overview of a process that they have in place uh, for validating training requirements and that they're being met before the adoption of new technology. A third was, again, an opportunity for, is there an opportunity for more collaboration between suppliers and providers to jointly refine some of the competencies for product use? Over time, as more users gain more experience in using these products in practice each day, they're constantly learning. And could there be really a learning circle that's created between these users uh, from the provider side and their interesting partners to find a way to further refine and then distribute lessons being learned from use that can help to create a better interface uh, for the users on the front lines of these products. And last, and I think was a, a slightly different topic, but I think very timely, is the challenge that providers are facing today especially those that have high turnover rates of their staff. Um, obviously, by having higher turnover rates is going to mean more temp staffing and frankly, just more new staff in the hospital. And how do the providers keep up with this cadence of getting these new uh, clinicians trained uh, to appropriately understand these products and how to appropriately use them? Second area of discussion, was related to the harm from the nuts, loose nuts and bolts on medical technology. The focus of this conversation really was around working together more to help improve the design of these devices. Can the providers and the suppliers open up communication channels to understand questions such as, when does this typically occur? Uh, and help to modify the designs on the supplier side to minimize this potential from ever occurring. The second thought that came forward is, are there opportunities for us to do more at the contracting stage by having language that addresses more specifically some of these issues um, through uh, maybe increased cadence of inspection of devices or other measures? The group also discussed uh, the cybersecurity challenge for home health and for mobile technology. Uh, here, the conversation focused on, since many of these new apps are so new that the providers and in some cases the suppliers are learning together. And can we recognize that and create more of a learning environment by creating mechanisms to share the lessons being learned by let's say power users or people that are having more experience um, and identify best practices and possibly for example, situations to avoid in the use of these new digital and home health technologies. And is there a way to do this in a way that doesn't penalize the supplier that's identifying this and proactively sending information out about some of the safety concerns that should be thought through? Because if one supplier is sending out these safety concerns, there may be a core assumption that maybe their product is not as safe as another supplier's, which is quite the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. And the last topic of discussion was supply chain as an engaged clinical partner. One of our provider members profiled some of the efforts that they've done at their organization where supply chain has integrated with their patient safety organization to the point that when a safety incident occurs, a supply chain member is part of the response team and sits through the root cause analyses and actions being taken to prevent that uh, safety incident from occurring again. Similarly, supply chain has become part of their proactive patient safety huddles and their daily patient safety calls, uh, which really makes them arm in arm, side by side with the rest of the clinical staff 
as a partner in proactively pursuing patient safety in the organization. I think this is a fantastic example and, and maybe something uh, I would imagine many of our SMI members are actively working in a similar capacity. Uh, and there may be some best practice here, best practices here that could be that could be emphasized going forward. So at this point, we'll go to our last poll, which would be slightly a different question. That of these four areas that we just highlighted that we had discussion before, that I believe that SMI could best address the following challenge. Uh, for example, which of these areas do you think that maybe SMI could dig a little deeper in and would there be value there? So Nancy, could you open up the poll for us? I'm launching the poll now. And we'll give it, as always, a little about, about 30 seconds for everyone to vote. And then I'll put the results and, and announce the results to everyone. <clears throat> About 10 more seconds for you to get your responses in. Great. So the results show that um, an overwhelming per percent of our participants believe that supply chain engaging as a clinical partner is the place where SMI could best address the, um, the challenges that they're facing, their members are facing. And that's good news for us because we actually do have a clinical integration um, initiative going on now um, that we should be seeing some results from in the next four to six months. They're doing a lot of research right now on other clinical integration models that are in the marketplace and going to be sharing that information with members via tools on the website. And we'll be sharing some of that information at our spring forum with the attendees there as well. Um, then hazards and safety risks related to user error got 14%. The supply chain engaging as a clinical partner got a 71% um, interest, interest level. So that's great for us to know that we're on the right track. Um, harm from loose nuts and bolts and cybersecurity challenges each got 7%. So I think we're, I feel like we're on the right track and thanks Tom for helping us figure that out. Great. Well, now we've, we've, we've highlighted the safety issues. Uh, we've given an overview of the discussion that took place in the fall. Uh, I believe we have about uh, a little less than 10 minutes left. What we'd like to do is shift the Q&A to you, uh, today's webinar participants. Of how do you think uh, supply chain leaders uh, could contribute to addressing these concerns. Uh, so I'll put up the, the top 10 list. Uh, and I believe, Nancy, you'll, you know, if people have questions, they can enter them in through the chat function. Is that correct? They absolutely can. That's correct. Yep. And in the meantime, Tom, what, what thoughts do you have for the group on um, specific supply chain strategies? We talked through some in those recommendations and ideas from the fall forum. Are there any other ideas that you've seen that are effective out in the marketplace in all of your work? Well, I think that the, you know, well, first I would say is for each of the items that I've highlighted here, um, in the report that we have, we provide some of our thoughts on how, um, how you can go about starting to address each of these concerns. So we don't like to just throw out, here's a challenge, uh, go figure it out. Uh, we do in these reports, and again, these are freely available as a public service, do provide some some recommendations on steps that you could take for each of the of the 20 top 10 patient concerns or hazards that we've highlighted here today. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, loose nuts and bolts. You know, one of those can be profiling the types of devices you have, uh, updating uh, whether it be from your clinical engineering or other perspectives, uh, maybe the frequency of of review of those devices. Um, in the infection control, I think that the Looking at the, I've actually personally have worked with one health system that did a um, an effort to centralize all the sterilization processes in their clinics through the central sterile department, so that they could move variation out of their practices. Now, not everyone can do that. That did take a great investment to do that, but those are just two small examples of things that I've been seeing folks pursue. Excellent. And Tom, to, to be um, relevant to a key topic that we're facing today, 
um, relative to the uh, coronavirus, the COVID-19 issue that's all around the, the world these days, does ECRI have any data or information that you could share today relative to patient safety or other mm -hmm. issues relative to coronavirus? Just any general information? Yes, th thanks for raising that, Nancy. In fact, we do. Um, and one thing we put together uh, about a week or so ago is we put together a compilation of information that we have that we think would be helpful for, uh, for anyone to be addressing this. So on our website, uh, we have created a link to a preparedness site um, as a public service. And on this site, we are providing information resources, for example, information that we have published that was only available to our members before, but we're making it publicly available, information on uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, um, sources of providers of some of this equipment, uh, alternate providers of this equipment, because obviously that access to these supplies is becoming a big challenge, um, and also guidance on use and other, and also from our evidence side information as well. So there's information coming from our technology and supplies information, our patient safety quality, as well as the evidence side, um, and then also reference links to information from other key sites such as the CDC and so forth that hopefully will be helpful as all of us are trying to address this great challenge. Excellent. Wonderful. Does anyone else have any questions to submit? If you do, please submit them via the chat feature. Let's see. In your opinion, Tom, does cutting supply costs or um, or preventing infections have a greater impact on operating income in the hospital? That may be a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> I think it is. Uh, all the above would be my, my safe answer. Um, I think, uh, well, number one, obviously we're in healthcare to take care of patients, number one. Um, so, you know, patients come to our hospitals expecting to get better, not to be harmed. So I think we obviously have an obligation to not harm patients that come to our institutions. Um, and from an organization that's founded as a nonprofit focused on the patient, uh, that's where I begin to lean. Of course, you can't have the doors of the hospital open if you don't have margin. Um, and so obviously, it's, it's obviously that value conversation. But, uh, you know, obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing that needs to be take place. Um, and I think wherever we're aware of the potential for, I don't think it's an all or none question. I think when we have the opportunity to address uh, a, a harm issue, uh, I think we need to address that. Um, and in some cases, the standard to where we can go from a cost perspective, for example, a, let's take a remote physician office, that it's probably not practical to have the supply chain department sterilizing the technology there. However, they may create the competency training and exams that are pushed out to those offices that are part of your health system and that you can get some of that value by taking that knowledge you may have within your systems and add, adding less variability by adding more education for the staff that may not be a full-time professional in, in uh, Central Sterile. Very good. Thank you very much, Tom. And I'd like to thank you for this um, excellent webinar today, for sharing all this great insight with our members. Um, we really appreciate your time. Uh, just a reminder, we will be sending the slides out to all participants, and the recorded webinar will be available on the SMI website after we get it finished and uh, ready to go today. Um, and finally, we would really appreciate your feedback on this webinar. You will be getting a request for feedback for us from a survey. It's really important to get your feedback so that SMI can make sure we're doing programming that meets the needs of our members. So as always, we really appreciate your feedback. Thanks so much to everyone for your time today. Thanks, Tom. And we hope you all have a very good afternoon.